Morning, everybody. Um, let's see. Tomorrow's lab. There's something that you should be bringing if you don't want to use ours. Goggles, right? It's safety, eye, eye safety gear, right? Um, and um, we'll instruct you tomorrow how to avoid um, goggle face, raccoon. Right? You always know the chemistry students have come out of chemistry lab. Uh, let's see, so we got that. Um, yeah. They can be safety glasses as long as they have the ANSI Z97 stamp on the on the glasses or the lens. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then you're, they're probably not safety goggles. They can't be sunglasses. They can't be ski goggles unless those have the ANSI rating stamps on them. Yeah, yeah, you'll be in the dark. Uh, no, that, that's fine. Right, so if you got a pair of shop goggles, you got a pair of um, hunting uh, goggles or glasses that you wear, or something like that, right? Um, what's that? Welding mask. Welding mask. That's kind of overdoing it, but yes. <laughs> as long as it's got the, it needs to be Z97 for impact. Uh, that's the that's the right word. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, if you have not gotten at least halfway through chapter three and are not done with chapter three by tonight, you're officially behind. I know that puts panic into a lot of you, but again, what's happening next Thursday? The exam. So homework is due Wednesday of next week for chapter four, right? Chapter three was a slightly shorter chapter, again, because we cut it in half and because we only covered one day. But this is the meat, like of the first unit, what we're doing today and Monday really is the, the whole enchilada. And I hope that you will start kind of putting the pieces together here. Because what we're going to do is chapter two. Chapter two, we did horizontal motion, like cars and things, just speeding up or slowing down. And then we did vertical motion. Remember the balloon and, and the problem we had in lab last week with the car going, with the rock going up and down? Only now we're going to put that together. And we're going to do that simultaneously. And so what we have, right, is a motion, okay, that we call projectile motion, right? And you already know the mathematical path that this thing takes. What is it? It's a parabola, okay? Projectile motion is when anything is moving in free fall. So this is projectile motion as long as we ignore what? Resistance. Air resistance. And it's safe to do because this thing isn't moving very fast. OK. Is this projectile motion? Yes. <laughs> because the object was in free fall. Doesn't have to be moving sideways to be projectile motion. Although generally we say projectiles, right, are launched both sideways and vertically. Is this projectile motion? Yes. Is this projectile motion? Yes. Like any object that is freely falling, okay, is de by definition a projectile because only gravity is acting on it. So what we need to do is we need to bring in chapter three. Right? We learned these vector things, and there's a reason that we learned about vectors. And what it's going to do is it's going to unlock this motion for us where we are forced to break the motion up into parts. As an example, let's say we do throw a ball into the air. What direction is gravity pointing here? Down. That means the acceleration that this object is going to experience will be pointed vertically downwards. However, the object does, if we like throw it up at an angle, right? Okay. The object has horizontal speed, v sub x. And it has vertical speed, v sub y. The actual speed that it left with, we'll call it initial speed, so we'll put v naughts on them, okay? That actual speed, v naught, it left with some speed, 10 meters per second at an angle of 60 degrees. What are we going to do to the initial velocity? What do we call v naught x and v naught y? The components, right? Okay. 
And so if I put my angle right here, which is typically the launch angle that we're given, how are we going to calculate V naught x? Sine of cosine. Cosine, how do you know it's so fast? Touching the angle, right? So V naught x will be V naught cosine theta. V naught y will be V naught sine theta. For chapter four, we're generally going to give you launch angles that are measured from the horizontal. And so 98% of the time, it's going to be cosine for x, sine for y. But again, we're going to switch that up starting chapters 5 and 6, so just watch out, okay? And, and practice and be ready. It's easier to practice, right, when it's easy than when it gets really hard. All right, so we've got that kind of motion. We know our acceleration, okay, is negative 9.8 meters per second squared straight down, and we have to break the motion up because we have a situation where, yes, it's moving both sideways and vertically, but it's being accelerated only vertically. And so in projectile motion, there is this special, special conditions, right? Assumptions that we're going to make. Our acceleration in the x direction will be zero. That means if this thing leaves moving at 5 meters per second horizontally, it will always have 5 meters per second horizontally. That's not going to change. That's what that acceleration says, right? We're not going to change the horizontal piece of its motion. What is going to change instead, though? The vertical part of its motion. Okay. So if I, if I throw it sideways, it continues with the same sideways velocity, but it's going to speed up vertically. And what we're forced to do, because the accelerations are different on the, in the different directions, where a y will be equal to negative g, right? We have this situation where we are, we're forced to break it up. So that means our toolbox. Well, there's two. Oh my gosh, is there, is there six equations? Because we could write the first equation as v sub x equals v naught x plus ax times t. What just happened? Is this a brand new equation? No, good, good. It's not a brand new equation. It's the first equation. I just put x's on, right, to be very clear that I'm talking about the motion in the x direction. Second equation, v naught x t x t squared, and then v x squared equals v naught x squared plus 2 a x delta x. All right, so there's our toolbox. But that, we can also write this for the y direction. See, I'm separating out the x and y directions. So in, instead of v x, I write v y, v naught y plus a y times t. And then a delta y equals v naught y t plus one half a y t squared. These are the same equations. They've got slightly different paint job on them. You know, one of them's got blue tape on it. The other one doesn't. A, no, not one half. Plus two a y delta y. There we go. And it looks like, oh my gosh, right? We've got six equations now, Mr. Balo, instead of three. Well, actually, no, we only have four equation. Because now we consider these special conditions that we have for projectile motion. Remember, projectile motion by definition, no acceleration in the x direction, all the accelerations in the y direction, and it's gravity doing the accelerating. So what does that mean for our, the first x equation over here? What term do we get to get rid of? Uh, yeah, the, the a times t term, don't we? Because that's zero. And so that goes to zero. And what does the first equation tell us? Yeah, duh. We haven't sped it up or slowed it down, right? The acceleration is zero. So we expect whatever we start with is what we end with. OK, what happens to the, third, or the second equation? We get rid, whoa. We get rid of the term, right? It's got acceleration x equal because ax is zero. And then we do the same thing with the third equation. So the first and the third equations turn out to be useless. 
I mean, they're true statements, but they're not going to help us problem solve at all. And so we're going to get rid of those. And, and the only thing that survives... in any kind of useful form, is the second equation, but with no acceleration in it. So when it comes to the toolbox of projectile motion, this is it. Now your book, again, is going to try to confuse you. And your book's going to go in, it's going to write something down like, um, uh, we'll, do the, uh, we'll do the second one. It'll say delta y, or it probably does even worse than that. It probably does y minus y naught equals... And then instead of V-naught Y, it's going to put V-naught sine theta times T minus one-half GT squared. Oh, okay, oh, what's going on here? Have they invented a new equation? It looks new, doesn't it? Right? It looks completely different and all that sort of stuff. But here's the trick. It isn't. Physics textbooks do this all the time. They bombard you with equations, and it turns out half of them are the same thing recycled. What did they do? Where did they get V naught sine theta? <laughs> From the initial velocity vector, right? That I just showed you. Okay. Where did they pick up a minus instead of a plus? They kind of hard coded this in here, right? I don't like this. The reason I don't like writing the equations like this is because. Number one, it makes you think that there's a brand new equation that's completely different from all the rest. And it's not. It's what we've used before. And second of all, it, it limits. This is a very limited tool. Okay? It's kind of like a, kind of like a torque screwdriver, right? Generally, if you've got a Phillips head, you can do 98% of the job. This is when the, the dumb Apple people put torque screws in the thing and you can't get it open, right? You've got to go find a special bit. This is very specialized. And I'd rather that you have this toolbox here and be able to handle any acceleration in the y direction. What if it's, what if it's not Earth, right? What if we're on the moon? What if, what if we're accelerating it down with a rocket motor or something? We can do all of that with this toolbox. We just change the acceleration from negative g to something else, right? And the same thing goes for hard coding in that angle right there. What if the angle we're given isn't the one from the horizontal? Well, we want to be careful. We, want to all, we don't want to think that it's always V naught sine theta. It could be different. So, again, I'm trying to teach you a higher way here, right? A broader range of thinking so that you can solve all the problems, not just one. All right. I'm actually, I should probably. You guys see the green pen okay? Is it, is it dark enough? I'm going to actually copy this toolbox onto the board up here. Because uh, I'm going to reference it over and over and over again today. One half a y t squared. I'm going to make sure I do it right. B y squared equals b not y squared plus two a. Uh, are you required to memorize these equations at all? No. No. Are you going to memorize these equations? Yeah. Probably. <laughs> right. Like you'll just use them so often, right, that they'll just kind of start to stick. But for the exam. When you go into the exam and you have your sudden bout of amnesia during the exam, you know what I'm talking about, okay, okay. What are you going to have to help you? Cheat sheet, summary sheet, right? You going to have these on there? I would. Okay, can I take the hat off? We're good. We're going to do vectors all day long, but can I take, or do you want it on? Leave it on. For you guys, anything. All right. Well, sort of. I won't give you the test answers. All right. So let's let's do an example of using this toolbox. Okay. And the exam. Okay. So for this example, I need you to give me an object that you would like to see thrown off of a cliff. Textbook. A what? Physics professor? Now we're getting too personal. <laughs> a water bottle? Textbook? Textbook? I mean, everybody throws textbooks, right? Well, don't throw your iPad if you've got an ebook. Trash. Trash? Now we're getting really human. A tomahawk. A tomahawk? <laughs> wow. 
wow, that's the first time in 23 years anybody suggested we throw a tomahawk off of a cliff. Why are we throwing a tomahawk off of a cliff? <laughs> I, I, I'm interested. I, I'm a little bit worried for your uh, mental state because of the living things that you mentioned. They were all human. All right, tomahawk it is. So let's see here. We have. We're, we're okay. So there's a cliff. Okay. And uh, I think I actually have numbers in here to speed this up. Yeah, okay. So I have a 75 meter tall cliff. Right? And that's measured from the, the cliff height down to um, the lake or the ocean. Okay? Uh, is down here. Right? And our tomahawk, and again, does the object matter? No, right? It's just part of the story of the problem, right? Whatever. Okay, so tomahawk. And um, for those of you not aware, tomahawk is a Native American uh, axe or hatchet, typically shorthand. All right, so we have this tomahawk. And it, what I like to do is I kind of like to draw what the tomahawk is doing. So we're going to throw it upwards off the cliff, right? And we're, we're, we're not going to, sometimes in the problems, like, the cliff is 75 meters tall, and the person is 1.2 meters tall. And what do they want you to do at that point? Uh, at, okay. We're launching at 75 meters. Um, let's see. Let's launch. What's, uh, I got an, uh, not what is it. I gave it an initial speed of 40 meters per second at an angle of 50 degrees above the horizontal. So what I like to do is I like to go in. And I like to sketch out kind of just maybe with a dotted line. Again, this is my visualization. This is the problem-solving process. When you visualize, sometimes pictures help. And I really feel like they help in Chapter 4. Because we'll have situations where we launch like this. There might be situations where we are on the ground and we launch up on top of a building. Right? Or maybe there's a situation where the thing is shot completely horizontally and it just falls off the edge. You'll, you want to have kind of get a picture down to see if your visualization matches what the writing is telling you. I know a lot of you have been emailing this about, I don't know where to start. How do I start? You start and draw a picture. Any picture. Like what is in your head when you read those words? And then go back and forth between the words and the picture and see if it, if it lines up. And one of the best ways to see if it lines up is to show it to somebody else, right? Like, is this what you see, right? You don't want to be flying alone. You really want that feedback from study buddies, group members, tutors, something, right? You know I'm slow. I got like a 24-hour turnaround. So find ways to, that's not asking chat GPT if this is correct. I saw hilarious uh, one of the physics professors in, in the UK started, uh, did a YouTube video of, he asked ChatGPT a bunch of physics questions. Dumpster fire. Sometimes they got the right number, but had completely wrong explanation. Other times they had the right explanation, and then the calculation was like just wrong. It was hilarious. The AIs will not be replacing me or you anytime soon. Okay, so get that visualization. Now, what did we do as part of chapter two visualization that may or may not have helped you? Something specific we did when, we, when I was showing you how to visualize one dimensional thing. Well, we're not to the plan yet. Do you remember the list? The list of things we could know and not know? Well, what are all the things we could know and not know now that we have this toolbox? We could know or not know the initial y velocity. Now, when you see the y on there, you got to think, okay, the vertical piece, right? We could know, well, I guess vy comes first in our list, okay? Not that order matters. A, y, t, um, and then after that, we get a delta y, and I'm going through looking for new symbols. Don't see any until I get to the fourth equation. And I have a delta x and I have a v naught x. Now, I tend to organize them in the order that they come out of the toolbox. You're more than welcome to put the two initial velocities next to each other. It doesn't matter. The point is, this is the entire list of things we could know or not know 
that this toolbox is able to deal with as long as we're not changing the acceleration. Does the acceleration change after it's launched? No, no. no gravity is pulling down on it only after that. So is the speed that it has when it hits the water zero? No. When is the speed of an object zero? At max height. Although this one's speed at max height is not zero. Why? It's moving sideways. The vertical component of its velocity is zero at max height. So we're having to be a little bit more careful now, right? At max height, the vertical speed has gone to zero, but it's still moving sideways. Remember I told you, the sideways motion never changes. That speed stays constant. All right, so do we know the final vertical component of the object's velocity when it strikes the water? Do we know how fast it's going straight down, by? Well, that, that's, that g is not a velocity, it's an acceleration, right? So we, we don't know that. Oops. All right, do we know the initial vertical velocity? Not yet, but we can find it. And so sometimes, even before I start writing this list, if I see an angle and a velocity, the first thing I do is break it up into its components, like even before I read the rest of the problem, right? Because I know I'm going to need those components anyway. So the vertical, sorry, the horizontal and vertical components of this speed, we're going to do sine or cosine for v naught x. How do you know? Because it's touching, not because it's x, but because it's touching the angle. This is going to be uh, 40 cosine 50 degrees. And this one's going to be 40 sine 50 degrees because I already used cosine or because it's not touching the angle. Okay, so this one is 40 sine 50 degrees. Uh, what is uh, our vertical acceleration, AY? Negative 9.8, negative G. Again, that's our, because it's in free, it's projectile motion. Do we know how long the object is in the air? No. Yep. Do we know how far vertically the object falls? Do we know delta Y? What is the 75 meters? initial minus, what was it? Negative 75. We do know the displacement. This thing has to go from its launch position down to the water, and that's a difference of 75. But what direction does it end up going? <laughs> negative. So, so that negative sign, that is, that is critical. Like, all of the physics is sitting right there in that minus sign. You're going to come to me, Mr. Gray, the Wally plus hates me, I'm right, it's wrong. And I'm going to look at your work, and I'm going to go, uh, negative sign. And you're going to die inside. Because you spent two hours on that problem, and it was just the minus sign. You're going to come to me, and you're going to go, Mr. Bale, why would you mark me wrong? I did it right. I'll look at it, well, you didn't put a minus sign on the 75. And you'll die a little inside. And you'll go, Mr. Bale, it's just a minus sign. And I'll be, no, it's V minus sign. The one minus sign forged in the heart of Mount Doom, in the land of Mordor where the shadows fall. One sign to rule. No, wait, wait. It's critical. You've got to give the tools the right information. If you tell this thing that it launches upwards, and accelerates downwards, but then ends up higher than where it started, you better be darn sure that that's what's going on in reality. So we've, again, I can't stress enough that when you're making these lists, when you're putting numbers into your calculator, when you're getting numbers out of your calculator, you need to be asking, why is the sign the way it is? If it's positive, why is it positive? If it's negative, why is it negative? Why did I put a positive sign on V not Y? I didn't write it down, but it's positive. 
Why did I put a positive sign here? Which way does it launch? Vertically, right? It launches upwards and to the side. So I'm going to give it a positive sign. Okay. Uh, do we know how far horizontally the object moves from its initial position? No. And do we know how fast it's going horizontally when it launches? Yes. yes. It's plus 40 cosine 50 degrees. And again, why did I put a positive sign on there? Because I'm calling to the right positive, aren't I? Direction it's going. All right, we can uh, do some calculator mischief here. Let's see. Uh, v naught x is 25.7 meters per second. V naught y is 30.6 meters. That's just putting it into my calculator again. They're both positive. Uh, all right. Let's find everything. And by everything, I mean anything. I want to know this tomahawk's political preferences by the time we are done here, right? So, um, what do you want to go for first? Should we go straight for time? How long is the tomahawk in the air? Launched to the ground? Why not? Let's do that. So, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm looking for this. So, turn to your neighbor and tell them what the strategy is. You're thinking about what tools in the toolbox you can use to find time given those things. Go. All right, which, which equation are you going to use? Second one? Second one works because, do we know delta y? Do we know v naught y? We don't know t, but we're looking for it. That's okay. Do we know ay? Okay, doable. Did anybody come up with this alternate universe uh, way of doing it? Where do you use French? No. Can we go third equation? Oh! Since I said we're going to find everything, why don't we just find everything, right? Let's find the final y velocity as it strikes the water. And then what can we use to find time at that point? Top one. Guess what? We're going to do, we're going to do both ways. As a check, right? To see if what we're doing is right. So uh, first strategy, use the second kinematic equation, projectile motion equation. Oh, that's not an x. V naught y t plus one half a y t squared. Do that and then solve this for t. All right, math majors, what are we staring at here? This is a quadratic. It's quadratic in t. This thing has the same form of ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay, especially if we rewrite some stuff. Whenever quadratics involved, I just throw the numbers in. I don't bother to do it symbolically. So I'm going to put in negative 75 equals 30.6t minus 4.9t. Oh my gosh, what just happened? Where did the minus 4.9 come from? It's negative 9.8 divided by 2. I've seen it so often, right, that I just sub it in. And then I go on to make the mistake of doing 1 half times negative 4.9, so I end up with like 2.45. <laughs> like, it's bad. But yeah, that's what happened there. Okay, so rearrange some stuff. 4.9t squared minus 30.6t minus 7. I just, I just moved. My math teachers always taught me I had to move everything to the left-hand side. I later turned out to be a lie. I don't trust math teachers anymore. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's what I was taught. And so now it has that form, ax squared plus bx plus c. So what's a? 4.9. What's b? Negative 30.6. And what's c? Negative 75. Okay. So um, I, don't, I don't do quadratics anymore. I refuse. What I do instead is I use Wolfram out. So just to show you. And, and you're welcome to use this on your homework. You can't use it on the exam. <laughs> but you can ask Wilhelm Alpha things like solve 
4.9 t squared uh, minus, it's suggesting things for me, minus, uh, what would we say, uh, 30.6 t minus 75 equals 0 for t. In theory, what has happened? I told you to mirror the display. Darn it. Thank you, Shelby. You guys were just going to let me hang there for a while, weren't you? Anything to get back to your teachers, right? Anything. So you can see that I, I typed in, right, the formula, and then it's giving me a useless result because it's math. Um, let's, uh, let's do the approximate forms. Okay. Oh, there we go. And it even graphed it for me, but that's not what it goes the other way. Math. All right. Two answers right here, right? Which one do we pick and why? <laughs> Your math teachers have done such violence to your understanding of the universe. You're wrong when you say I'm going to pick the positive one because time can't be negative. That's wrong. Time can be. I'm a physicist. Ask. I can make it negative anytime I want. Okay? That is simply a choice of coordinate system direction. Okay? These two answers, the mathematical question that was asked was, when is this object at negative 75? That, that's, that's the mathematical question that we asked. So, so if I go back to, bring this back to this, otherwise everything goes wrong. So if I go back to this, okay, we asked kinematic equations, when is this object at negative 75? Kinematic equations were like, well, it's quadratic in T, so there is like this extra, I don't have the right color, let's do purple, this purple. All right, so it's like a whole parabola here. And we asked it, when is it here and here? And so being a math algorithm, it told us. It said, well, there's two solutions to that. Negative whatever it was, 1.88, or positive 8.12. Where's the negative 1.88? This one? How do you know? It's not because it's negative. I can flip the signs on that anytime I want. I can redefine this thing and swap coordinate system and done, and I can get negative 8.12 and positive 1.88. That's just a math feature. Let's get away from the positive negative thing. How do you know the 1.88 is wrong? It was B. How do you know it was before it was thrown? Look at this. There are two sections. There's a section right here that is shorter. And there's a section right here that is longer. You got two answers. Which of these sections is the physical one? The longer one. It doesn't matter what the sign is. The fact that the number... The solution here was negative 1.88 or 8.12. I know to pick 8.12, not because it's positive, but because it represents the larger portion of the parabola that this tomahawk is traveling on. What if, what if we did this one, right? Uh, we're about to do a problem like this, but let's, let's say instead we threw it down like this. Right? So it has negative initial speed. And it kind of does this. Well, the full parabola, the mathematical path of that is this. And we get two answers, right? Which of the two answers are we going to pick? The bigger or smaller magnitude one? Smaller. Don't let the math do the thinking for you. Math is beautiful. But it often gives you too much information, including the non-physical answers. And a plus or a minus sign, that really comes down to a choice of coordinates. 
So I'm asking you to be careful, right? Look, interrogate your answers and go, why? Why is this that way? In the case of positive and negatives on quadratics, <laughs> always ask. Okay, so we're going to go with 8.12 because it represents the larger portion of the parabola. And so that's our time. All right, seconds. I always got to put a unit on. So we found the time. Uh, we could use that time to find the final y component of velocity, right? But I said we should do everything right so that we can check it. So let's go ahead and find this final y velocity, sort of independent of the time. So which one of these is independent of the time? Third one, right? Okay. So our plan is to use the third equation and solve it whoops, for y, final y velocity, which it almost already is. I just need to take square root of both sides. V naught y is what? What's the number? Positive 30.6. It doesn't matter. I'm going to square it anyway. Plus 2 times a negative 9.8 times a negative. Oh, boy. What would have happened if we had put positive 75 in there? We might, we were running a risk at that point of coming up with an imaginary number, right? And that would have been a dead giveaway that you're doing imaginary physics, okay? Which works in Hollywood, but doesn't work for this. And then we, we go and we, we get a number here. Uh, did I get this one? I might have done this a slightly different. Uh, where is it? V, Y, uh, I got 49. Did anybody else put this in their calculator? Okay, good. I can't read my handwriting. I didn't bring a pen. All right, so this is four. Now, it's plus or minus 49 because it's a square root, right? So what sign are we going to put on it? Why negative? We are solving... For the vertical velocity, the vertical component of velocity, which way is the tomahawk going when it strikes the water? It's going down. So what do we have to put in for Vy? We have to put in a negative sign. That's the physical thing that is happening. Okay. So we got the final y velocity. Um, can we can we get the distance now? The horizontal distance that this tomahawk moves. That would be measured as from there to there. That would be delta x. Do we have everything we need to be able to solve for delta x now? Do we do we know the initial x velocity? Do we know the time? We can do that. Let's do that. Delta. Uh, let's not do it right there. Delta x equals v naught x times t. So that's uh, 25.7 times 8.12 gives me delta x of. <laughs> two, thank you, 208.7. Okay. Um, but I, we should go back and check our um, time here, right? Independently. Let's say, so so my, for a check. Do it over here, check. Uh, let's use the first equation, we haven't used it yet, right? And let's put in our time and see if we get the same Vy. That's less algebra, isn't it? Like, it's already, this equation's already solved for the final y velocity, so it's not, it's not So we're gonna put in 30.6 plus a negative 9.8 times 8.12. And um, if someone wants to do that in a calculator real quick, I did it on my paper. Um, and that's how I got my 49, uh, negative 49. Did, anybody, did you get, please tell me you got negative 49. No? Oh, where's my plus or minus? There it is. I got 48.9, right? So I'm with 48.976. So if I round, 
<laughs> right? I'll get 49. I got the same thing. So what does that tell us? For being consistent, right? We're correct within the limits of the problem. Maybe I've completely screwed physics up and I've done three you know, mistakes in, in the row, but I'm pretty sure, right, that getting that right there tells me that my time is right in the ballpark. Okay. Is there anything else we can find out? I mean, we kind of solved for all the unknowns there, didn't we? Can we find out the maximum height the tomahawk achieves over the lake? We sure can. We want to find the maximum height above the lake. Where does, what is happening when the tomahawk gets to, I'm so run out of colors. Uh, we'll use red again. What happens when the tomahawk is at max height? The y velocity is zero. Remember, there's only one place where your y velocity can go to zero. Where is it? Maximum height. So if we feed vy equals zero into the kinematic equation, we say vy is zero. Then we've limited the tool to solving for just to max height. So if I can find the delta y to max height, then I can find out how far above the lake it is. All right. So how do I find the delta y to max height? Do I know? Is the time 8.12 now? No, we're talking about a different situation now, aren't we? We're not doing the whole parabola, we're just going up. So we could, I don't know, solve this one maybe for time and then plug it into this one, but that's more math than I want to do. I can use the third one. Do I know VY? Zero. Zero. Do I know this? Do I know this? Am I looking for this? Third equation is the plan. Solve it for delta y. Delta y is going to be vy minus v dot y with squares on them, all divided by 2ay, which is 0 minus uh, 30.6 all over 2 times a negative 9.8. So the signs are all going to work out. And I got uh, 47.8. A lot of 48s and 9s in here, isn't there? Okay. And then I put that into uh, y plus. I box it, and I'm done, right? You'll get that wrong if you put that in the y plus. What did the question ask for? Height above the lake. What is this delta y? It's the change in vertical position from the initial point. The 48.7 is from launch position up to max height. So what do we have to do? We add 75. We don't subtract 75, right? We're trying to put the distances together now to get the 122.8 meters above the lake. So we didn't start with much. We started with initial speed. We, start, we knew what our acceleration was. And that was kind of, and we knew our vertical displacement. And we were able to determine a lot of information about this object. We can go even further. I'm not going to demonstrate it. But we could say, where is the tomahawk five seconds after it's been thrown? Well, now we know what our time is, right? And we solve for a delta y to find the vertical position. The delta x finds the horizontal, and we'll know where it is. How, uh, the one last thing I do want to do, though, is how fast is it going? when it strikes the surface of the water. Do we know that answer yet? What do we know about when it strikes the water? We know that its vertical component of velocity is what? Negative 49. Why did I not do this in green? That was stupid. Let erase that, put it back in green. Okay, so we know that this is negative 49.
I asked, how fast is it going when it strikes the water? Is the answer 49 meters per second? Because what else is happening when it strikes the water? It's moving sideways. It has both horizontal and vertical components of velocity there. And I asked for how fast. That's a speed. Speed does not have direction. It's just a number. So if it's going negative 49 vertically and positive 25.7 horizontally, how are we going to find the total speed this thing has when it strikes the water? We have to add the components of the vectors. In other words, we have to find the magnitude of the hypotenuse. And how do we do that? Pythagorean theorem. Square root of 25.7 squared plus 49 squared. And I, and I know, I know your brains are full. And I know you're sitting there going, oh, Mr. Baylor, you said speed. And isn't speed velocity? And the answer is no. The devil's in the details here. The words that we use to describe these systems matter. If it says velocity, you better darn be well sure that you know the direction that that thing is going. If it says speed or how fast, well, that's just a number. It is usually the magnitude of the vector, not a single component. They might say, how fast is it going vertically? And then you would answer, well, 49 meters per second. You wouldn't put a minus sign on it because they simply asked for how fast, right? So read carefully. Be careful. Be precise, right? in what you are doing. All right. Let's, I think, I think a quiz is next. What happened? Yep, I was right. I love it. There are certain shows my wife just won't watch with me anymore. All right. What I'd like you to do right now is read this question. Don't worry about copying it down, because again, it's going to be on the PDF. Read the question, and then turn right away to your people around you and start visualizing this one together. Draw a picture, show it to your group. Figure out your list of knowns and unknowns. I'm going to give you like four or five minutes to do this. Go. I want you setting this up together. Right about now is when all the talking should start. Really just turn to each other, say, I'm lost, I'm confused, or this is what I think the picture looks like, and just start iterating on ideas. Go. Get them all out there. If you and your group mates are lost, now's the time to call me over.
All right, how many of you got this picture on paper? Okay, somewhat? Where did, did it go wrong somewhere? Yeah. Triangle, kind of, okay. Anybody else struggle, like have difficulty getting the words onto the page? Yeah? Where did, where, where did the disconnect happen? Overlooking and like accelerating back down. Okay. So I put your hand, you just lean back down. Okay, so like. That's kind of getting ahead of the problem, though, right? You're start. You're already in the weeds of speeding up, slowing down. Try to back off a little bit into like what's the physical picture, right? There's a hill. I'm rolling down it. But yeah, it is, is it easy to go wrong real fast? Okay. How do you learn to get these problems down correct on paper? Who said that? It's practice. So how do you practice? I'm giving you homework problems. Those kind of represent the target, right? But they tend to be the middle to hard difficulty problems at the end of the chapter. I've given you 10 to, I mean, some of them are conceptual, but I've given you like 10 mapping ones. There's like 100 of these at the end of every chapter. You have plenty of practice. I want to be clear. I'm not telling you to go do a hundred homework problems, right? What I'm saying is there's lots and lots of problems at the end of the chapter that you can practice just setting up. You don't have to do the problem. You can just practice setting it up. Ideally, with another person in the class right in front of you, so you can quickly iterate on all the bad ideas. That's what you need to do. You need to fail fast. Do it flying solo late at night while you're trying to cram your homework in before the due date, you're dead. Talking with somebody, having a discord where you're posting ideas together, anything like that where you can iterate quickly on ideas and throw out ones that oh, maybe that's not quite right. How useful was it to have somebody to talk to? Did some of you get to maybe this by talking to the person next to you or kind of close to it? Yeah. That's the power of working together. We take that away on the exam, right? So it's just you and the problem. But hopefully by then you've had enough practice with the words and 
what they're trying to say and the, the, the process of getting it from words into pictures, right? That the test won't trip you up. That's what we're trying to get you to do. All right, so this is what the picture looks like. Now let's start getting into sort of visualization, more visualization strategy, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to guess that a lot of you maybe ran into a problem as you kind of got this down and then maybe weren't sure where to start or what numbers went with what or what's going on. This problem has a dead giveaway in it for something you're going to have to do. Think chapter two. These equations only work if the acceleration is what? Constant or the same number. Is the acceleration changing in this problem? Yes. It goes from 2.6 meters per second squared directed down the hill to free fall when it goes off the cliff. So what do we have to do? We have to break it up into two problems. Have to. This book, this box cannot deal with it if it changes. So we have to apply kinematics to the portion where the car is on the hill, and we have to apply kinematics to the portion when the car is in the air. And I know you're sitting here going, Mr. Baylor, there's no way in a thousand years I would have known to do that. Well, now you do, right? <laughs> it's not about, oh, I failed, I failed, I failed. It's, oh, now I see if an acceleration changes. I need to do, I need to break the problem up into different parts. And guess, if we find out how fast the car is going as it rolls off the cliff, that final velocity will become the initial velocity for the car when it's in free fall, right? They feed into each other. All right. So what we have here is really two problems. We have the problem for while we are on the hill, and then we have the problem for when this thing launches off the edge and is in free fall. So let's tackle the first problem first. We need to get the final velocity, right? That, that's kind of what we're after. We're after the final velocity here so that we can know the initial velocity, right, of the second part. That's really what we're after. Okay, so what are we going to do? We know the acceleration in this first part is positive 2.6 meters per second squared directed down the hill, right? And we know that the displacement is positive 75. It goes right from 0 to 75 meters. Uh, let's see. Do we need to find components of that distance, components of that velocity, uh, acceleration? Break the velocity up into components? No? Or that's just so horrible that you don't want to, David, you keep pointing to the side. Why do you keep pointing to the side? <gasps> Is this a horizontal problem? In other words, is this a one-dimensional kinematics problem? Is the acceleration and the displacement and the velocity all in the same direction? Does it matter if it's tilted up or down the hill? No. This is a chapter two problem. Masquerading on a slope. For those of you who can't see it, just tilt your head. Oh, it's right there. We're doing a problem that says <laughs> an object starts at zero, accelerates to some final speed, with an acceleration of 2.6 meters per second squared, and it does it over 75 meters. We reach straight into chapter two. We don't even have to really go to chapter two. We can just look at this and go, okay, instead of y's, we could call it x's, right? But we are looking for a final velocity. We don't know the time, but we do know the delta y. Which of these equations doesn't have time in it? The third one. So instead of y's, we put x's on it. Right? And our strategy becomes the final x speed will be the initial x speed plus 2ax delta x. And then I just solve for it, right? The, the initial speed is 0 plus 2 times 2.6 times a positive 75 meters gets me 
a final x velocity of, I always pull my notes open before I start teaching, um, I got 19.8 meters per second. All right. So now that we know the final velocity that the car has as it gets to the end of the clip, what do we know about the initial velocity of the car? The initial velocity of the car coming off the cliff is going to be 19.8 meters per second at what angle? At 15 degrees below the horizontal, or if you want to say negative 15, that's fine. Whenever a degree is given, and it doesn't tell you what axis you are referencing, it's always the positive x-axis. So if it says negative 15 degrees, you're at the x-axis and you're rotating opposite, and you're going clockwise, because negative degrees, right? Unit circle. Okay. What do we now know in blue? The initial velocity. Why is this in the velocity? Yes, direction. So what are we going to do? Before we even set up the rest of the problem, what do we know we're going to have to do? It's in free fall now. We've got to find the component. We've got to find the pieces x and y of this initial velocity so that we can use this, right, for the projectile motion of the car. So this is a v naught x equals v naught y equals. I'm just going to find them. All right. What does this look like? Um, let me make this just a tad bit bigger so it's easier to see. This thing comes off instantaneously at that point at that direction. We are looking for the x component and y components of that velocity, right? This is v naught. I want v naught x, and I want v naught y. Just looking at the components, tell me, is the x component positive or negative? Positive. It's pointing to the right. The y component, the initial velocity y component, positive or negative? Negative. Negative. Why? He's going down. So when you write this number down, you're going to write negative, and then you're going to write down the number, right? I would write 19.8 sine or cosine. Sine, because it's not touching. And I would just put 15 degrees in. If you put sine of negative 15, you get a negative answer. Don't do a double negative. I really encourage you to never put an angle in as a negative angle in your calculator, because your calculator is going to lie to you. Calculators are like, they, 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 they pre-program them to spit out the direction on the unit circle, blah, 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 coordinates. It's not useful in the real world. Okay? Always use positive angles, less than 90 degrees, you will be safe. All right, uh, V naught X is going to be 19.8 cosine 15 degrees. And again, I'm, I'm not using the negative sign. I've checked the sign. I know what direction these things need to point. Because I've drawn the picture. I've thought about it. I've used physics. All right. Uh, do, uh, these have numbers. 19.1 for v naught x, and v naught y is negative 5.11. And why am I asking if it's, I'm looking at it. Why did I put a negative sign on it? It's going down. If I don't know the answer to that, I've got to find the answer. I've got to study buddies, bounce it off, right? Chegg is not a good study buddy. Chegg doesn't tell you these things. It doesn't ask you these things. It just gives answers, and then you're robbed of a learning moment. All right. And I know there's more out there than just Chegg. It's just the one I like picking on. What are we trying to find? I'm lost. What are we doing? How far horizontally? So, so how far? What are, what are they asking for? Delta X. How far horizontally? That's delta x. Uh, how long? What are they asking for now? Time, after it leaves the cliff. Uh, and magnitude of the velocity when it strikes the water. What are they asking for? 
they're asking for when this thing strikes the water, we will know the horizontal and vertical pieces. We can find those, vy, vx. And what will we have to do to get the magnitude of that velocity? Pythagorean theorem, right? We've got the pieces. we got to get the whole enchilada, right? So we would use Pythagorean theorem. We're out of time to finish this problem. Okay. But the important part has been done, where I showed you, you got to change. if you've got a change in acceleration, you've got to break it up. The rest of this problem acts like the problem I did before. Uh, let me just give you the answers, because some of you are going to complain to me if I don't. Uh, delta X is 96.1 meters. Solve it second. Don't do it first. The time is 5.036 seconds. That's the time in the air. And the final speed that it strikes the water with is 57.7 meters per second. There they are. Uh, tomorrow, what are you bringing or going to be forced to be used? Take the goggles. We are doing the tomahawk problem tomorrow in lab. There will not be tomahawks. Okay, we'll be on the little metal balls. But look that problem over again because we're going to be solving it over and over again tomorrow as we practice this stuff in lab. And I'll see you then. Have a fantastic rest of the day and be safe.